everybody, Taylor Sparks here. And today I have a video where I'm gonna be talking about SciSpace's Copilot. Now, before we get started, picture yourself as a brand new PhD student. Your advisor gives you a bunch of papers to read to get familiar with the topic. You open up that PDF and you don't understand half the words you see. That was me. 15 years ago when I was a brand new PhD student, I remember digging in the literature and I just didn't know what they were talking about. One paper in particular, this one here, thermal power and cobalt oxides, I have it so outlined and marked down. I've written my notes on the margins. It's from this Japanese uh, group of researchers, and it was foundational to the rest of what would become my PhD dissertation. But at the time, I didn't know what the crap they were talking about. There were so many terms in here that were unfamiliar to me. I remember I would take it to people in my department, smart folks, right? I was at UCSB and then later at Harvard, and I was taking it to people trying to understand you know, this Hikes formula and some of the terms that were used in it. And people were just as confused as I was at where some of these numbers were coming from. And in the end, I actually ended up emailing the authors and they were wonderful and they were kind and they explained to me what was going on. Now, that said, there's got to be a better way, right? There's got to be a better way than just stumbling through these papers. Whether you're a, a PhD student or a professor or you're a practicing engineer or just an interested member of the public at large, there's this huge body of knowledge and it's written in this academies, this really dense language that makes it so difficult to extract the information out of it um, that we're doing ourselves a disservice. Today, the product that I want to review could potentially fix that. So it comes from SciSpace. If you go to SciSpace.com, it's got this redirect to this typeset.io, which will show you what their product is, how it works, right? And you can read about it here. Essentially, it's the quickest way to read and understand scientific literature. You can just highlight portions of it, and it will tell you what it means in real time. Let me step, take a step back and show you what this means. First off, this is really closely related to some of the stuff that we've made videos about in the past. If you remember this video, this was the uh, how to automate your research paper, tips, tricks, and tools paper, or how to be an awesome grad student. My student Sterling put this together and showed how every part of the process of your paper, whether it's the figures, the tables, the equations, the body, the text, the captions, or the references, there's all these great software tools out there that make your life wonderful to bring all those together to a nice scientific document. Well, today what we're going to talk about is over here on the reference end. Let's say you've been using Zotero and you've got all these documents and you don't understand everything that's in those documents because it's impossible to. There's always stuff you're not going to understand. What do you do? Well, what I do right now, before any of this tool existed, is you Google it, right? You read something, you're like, orbital degeneracy, what's that? And you Google orbital degeneracy, and then you have to sort of dig through page after page of Google search results to try and figure it out. This company is addressing that pain point by creating something different. You open your document up in their awesome PDF viewer, which just looks like an, a browser, you know, Acrobat Reader sort of thing, and then in real time, you can get explanations. So for example, I can highlight right here, Hike's formula, and check it out, it says explain this text with a click. Shows up over here in my co-pilot window and you see in real time, I highlighted it and said explain it. It says, okay, the explanation. The Hikes formula is an equation used to calculate the thermal power of a material at high temperatures. It's based on the number of configurations of charge without doubly occupied states and the degeneracy of spin. The Hikes formula is used to predict the thermal power of cobalt oxides. As is shown, the spin degeneracy induced by the strong correlation affects thermal power. If this had been a tool that I could have used in the year 20, what, 2009 or something when I probably first saw this paper, it would have changed everything. It, that's such a simple explanation. I wouldn't have have to been pestering these kind people and having them explain it to me, right? Very, very cool tool. So how does this work? How did it generate that? How did I just type that and get that? Or, you know, another one, you know, right, for example here, what are the key takeaways? By clicking that, it's able to say, well, the key takeaways of this research paper is that thermal power and cobalt oxides can be studied theoretically using the Hikes formula. It's shown that due to strong correlation of the 3D electrons and degeneracy caused by the crystalline field and Huntsville coupling, these oxides have large thermal power. The resulting you know, experiments explain why the sodium cobalt oxide had such high thermal power. Uh, that was something in the field that nobody knew why it was so high at the time. And this was the paper that explained why the high thermal power are present. So how is it able to do that? Like, is there some, you know, who's, who's providing this response? Is it a human in real time trying to type that up so fast? No, it's not. It uses the same technology that's behind ChatGPT, which in the last couple of months has been everywhere, right? When this came out, people have been losing their minds because all of a sudden ChatGPT, it's a chat bot that's built on top of the GPT-3, Transformable 3.5, right? It's a large language model that basically they, they gave it access to the internet's worth of text resources 
had it train off of that, and then you can ask it questions, you can chat with it, and using that corpus of knowledge, it's able to make context-aware responses that are just impressive. For example, let's do a quick one. What is an example of a high thermal conductivity metal? It says copper. Copper is an example of a metal with high thermal conductivity. So then I can follow up and ask, What is its thermal conductivity? It knows I'm talking about copper because it's a chat bot. It remembers previous you know, information that you've been conversing with it about. And sure enough, it tells you what it thinks the conductivity is. It says it's about 401 watts per meter Kelvin. It depends on the temperature. Now, how does it know this? Um, because it's seen lots and lots of examples in literature where that's been talked about. Now, th something like this, the thermal conductivity of copper, is such a common one that it's likely to get that right. It has been documented with ChatGPT that if you ask it, you know certain things they'll sometimes ask it you know who won the world cup this specific year and it'll say two countries that didn't actually play that year and yet it won't tell you that it wasn't sure about that it'll just give you an answer we call these hallucinations right chat gpt and the transform architecture is prone to hallucinations meaning it will tell you the answer to something but it might not be right okay more on that later but nevertheless this is a powerful tool and this is the, the stuff that's going on underneath the hood of things like SciSpace's Copilot. This is how it can provide these incredibly awesome responses in, a, in response to a question that you asked it as, as if it was a human right there next to you. So let's show you some more examples of this, right? I'm going to go over here to my library and let's pull up some more examples of papers and just show what this looks like, right? So this comes from a Kim Matter paper. Uh, that I published way back when I was a postdoc. And at the time, we were trying to bring together uh, performance analysis with resource analysis. Because it's not just enough to have a good material that uh, performs well. It should also be, say, non-toxic or earth abundant or things like that. So in doing this, we wrote this paper. So by the way, just, just take a look here at this interface, right? It has all the sort of stuff that you'd expect to see with like a PDF browser. You can zoom in, you can rotate, things like that. You can jump to pages. So it's nice in that way. But then this is where it gets really great. So again, as you were reading this, if you were a new PhD student reading this, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, it talks about the herfindahl hirschman Hirschman Index, and you were a material science student, so you had never seen that before, you're going to wonder, well, what on earth is that? Instead of hopping over to Google, where you have to search, and then find a page that you trust, and then read that whole page looking for the explanation in real time, check it out. It says, the HHI, herfindahl hirschman Index, is a measure of market concentration. It's used to measure the degree of monopoly, right? And it tells you how it's calculated, and you know, where does it come from? And it tells it all in the context of this paper where we're talking about elements. Check it out. It's saying it's calculated for most of the first 83 elements in the periodic table in this work. So, so cool. Um, but this can do other stuff, right? You'll notice up here it has this explain math and table where you can highlight something. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight this equation right there. Those that are familiar with thermoelectrics know that this equation has to do with thermoelectric figure of merit, ZT. So if you didn't know that, you could just highlight it and see what it tells you. You highlight just that image, it's going to extract out that equation from the image, and in real time it's going to now tell us what it thinks that, that is. Over here it says, okay, the highlighted text is a mathematical equation that describes the thermoelectric figure of merit. That's right, ZT. It tells you how it's written, where all the different components are. It tells you that this is the Zabeck coefficient, that that's electrical resistivity, that's your thermal conductivity. It talks about it. So, 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 so cool. Uh, maybe you came across this. You're like, okay, a, a Yonker plot. So what's a Yonker plot? If you aren't familiar with that terminology, then you click it, and just like before, it says, well, it's a type of graph that's used to visualize the relationship between Zabeck coefficient and electrical conductivity. It tells you what it's used for. So cool. So as you're reading this, you're going to skim the article or read the article anyways, but now what you can do is during this process, you can get real-time information if you come across something that you don't understand. Like right here, you know, maybe you don't know what this material is, sodium cobaltate. So you could ask it, what's that material? NaxCoO2. And it will do its best to try and explain it. Now, it may not get it right every time. And that is uh, a full disclosure sort of problem with our current large language model-based software packages like this, is that it will tell you what it thinks it is, but it might get some things wrong. So for example, it says for this material what it is, what it's made up of. It tells you what its conductivity is. I don't know if that's exactly the right number. It probably is. but. Since it pulled it right from the literature right below it, we can assume that that's correct. But sometimes it will report things, and you've got to be take it with the tiniest bit of a grain of salt. And that, I think, is one of the biggest uh, potential downsides of this software, is that it presents things like fact, 
but you don't know what confidence it has in everything, right? And this is just a fundamental limitation of transformers, which I hope we'll see solutions to in the near future. But for right now, even with that limitation, this is pretty awesome. If you didn't know what the MOT maximum metallic resistivity was, boom, you've got it. So very, very powerful. Pretty awesome. Let's show you another example. Let's go to this one. This comes from a Fizz Review letters paper that we wrote. This was a really heavy subject. It has to do with quantum materials. And if you've gotten into that field, you know that, holy cow, the jargon gets big and it becomes hard to understand it. So what's cool about it is, you know, just like before, you can highlight things. If you don't know what a topological insulator is, well, great. You can have it explain to you what a topological insulator is. And it'll tell you, you know, a topological insulator is one that has an insulating bulk, but doesn't conduct, um, but it does conduct along surface states, right? It says why and how. And if you want to ask a follow-up question, you can. Like, for example, maybe it's not clear why it doesn't in, it conduct in the bulk. So why does it not conduct in the bulk? And you can ask it that follow-up question, and it will further clarify a response. So, so cool, right? It talks about the fact that there's paired surface states associated with each half integer quantum value responsible for conducting. It's pretty awesome. And you can just keep on asking questions. If it's still using terminology you don't explain, you can ask it to further simplify it. Um, one of the things I like about this is you can ask it for like a summary too. Like, give me a brief summary of the key findings, right? Give me the key findings from this paper. Oh, that was in response to our other one. But still, uh, they tell you exactly what can happen here. So very, very cool. Let's look at another one. So for example, after I read this paper, this thermopower on cobalt oxides, back when I was a grad student, eventually we published a paper where we built upon it. We said, okay, they had one model. We now have an advanced new model based on top of it. It has to do with site inversion in cobalt 304 spinel. And if you're reading that, you don't know what site inversion in a spinel is, then you can just highlight it and it'll explain it to you. It says, okay, the text is referring to the research paper's findings that suggest either complete 100% inversion of a spinel if no change in the spin state, or a combination of about 40% minimum inversion if there is a change in the spin state. This means that the cation distribution of the spinel structure can be determined by measuring. If that's not clear, you can say, explain cation distribution in spinel. It says, okay, well, cation distribution in spinel refers to the arrangement of the cations, the positively charged ions, within the crystal lattice. In these cobalt-304 spinels, there's two types of sites, octahedral and tetrahedral. The cation distribution is determined by how many of these ions occupy each site type. For example, are they all on the octahedral side or the tetrahedral? This is so powerful, right? It talks about a Yon-Teller distortion. What's a Yon-Teller distortion? What is a Yon-Teller distortion? The sort of stuff that you used to have to sort of raise your hand in class and say like, hey, I didn't understand this, you can start asking this in real time. It tells you a yon teller distortion is a type of molecular or crystal structure that occurs when the energy levels are not equal. This causes the molecule to distort to reduce the overall energy, resulting in a lower electronic energy for the system. So, so, so powerful. This opens up the corpus of scientific text, which can be inaccessible to people because it's just too hard to understand. And anybody can start to understand the stuff now. You can make it, you can read these papers for the first time in ways that you really couldn't before. And complicated equations like this, you can just highlight them and have it explain what on earth is going on with that equation in a way that, gosh, you used to have to sort of read through and try and understand it. And now in real time, it's going to show us what that does. Sure enough, it says, okay, here's the equation. This is known as the Hikes equation. It's written like so, it tells you what all the different components are, describes how they come together. Um, just phenomenal. I'm just blown away by this. I'm absolutely floored by this. So even though this is a paid review, this is a product I'm already using, right? So I think I've shown you some of the things that I think are amazing about this. There are some other things that their software can do. So if we go to SciSpace and go to the homepage again, let's look at a few other things that it can do. Under this Discover tab, you can search for papers. They've got a whole bunch of famous ones, like Attention is All You Need, right? That's the famous Google paper that kicked off the transformer on which this is all built. A uh, bunch of other ones. But you can search for other ones. You can search by author, institution. Like when I go to author and I type in my name, what you get back is information that looks a lot like your Google Scholar report, right? It says that, okay, this guy is an H-Index 20, 24, 92 papers, a few thousand citations. That's not exactly the same as Google Scholar. It's actually undercounting a little bit. Um, 
but it's not bad. It's it's a pretty good resource. You can go by year and see the different papers. Like show me the 15 papers that were published that year. You can find them. You know, check this one out. This will provide you a six minute summary. Here, this one gives you, okay, I will give you an 11 minute summary. Let's go to this one. The six minute summary, it's broken it down into sort of bullet points. Here's everything in that paper delivered in a way that's totally different than what we're used to seeing with papers. It's explaining it in a way that might be much easier to look through. Since most of us actually skim papers anyways, I think most people do that, this is a really powerful new tool, I think, to look through stuff and learn things fast. Look at the one minute summary here, right? It tells exactly what they did in this one minute summary. Pretty cool, I think. I think that's pretty cool. So that's one thing it can do. Other things it can do, you can you know ask questions here. You can look by journal. Um, something that I like is that you can actually create your own library, right? So for example, here here I, I custom uploaded right seven or eight papers to show you in this demonstration here. But if you're like me and you've been using Zotero, as we suggested in this video here, maybe you've got a whole bunch of papers. They made it so you can actually import all of those right at once. So we're going to import from Zotero. And all I had to do was just link my account, which I already did, but it took like one second to just type in my password to Zotero. And then check it out. I can bring in every paper I wrote on that or maybe my entire PhD dissertation with, I don't know how many papers were in that, tons of them. And you can import them and almost instantaneously, now all of those papers are here where I can do the same things that I did before. I can highlight text, I can copy stuff, and it keeps track of it all for you. That's something that's pretty slick. Normally when you have this sort of stuff in Zotero, you keep track of your notes. What's great is that here it also keeps track of it, right? So if I go to my PhD dissertation and I start asking about one of these things, if I, if I you know, ask it the key takeaways or whatever else, when I come back to it later, the questions that I typed or the notes that I took are still present in this Copilot window. It keeps track of them, which is really, really cool, I think. So that's pretty awesome. Now there are some other things it can do. If you go to this, my formatted documents, Technically, they have another tool where they let you not just read documents here, but prepare them. So you can actually, you know, you can upload an MS Word file, for example, and then you can try and convert it. Here's an example I did, I uploaded earlier. I uploaded a document that I had previously submitted and it was actually published in the Journal of Journal of Materials Research, JMR. Well, what if that had been rejected during the review process and I needed to submit it to a different journal? They have a tool that allows you to transform it from one format to another. So here I've transformed it. Check it out. It's been formatted to Wiley Journal of the American Ceramic Society. So now you can see how it's been transformed. They did their best to make sure that it obeys the new rules in terms of how things get formatted. That mostly comes into like your references and how the figures get presented. Um, this I was a little bit less impressed with with their software. The this tool for the Copilot for reading and enhancing your understanding of papers, phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. This one I found was a little bit buggy, and where I write things in LaTeX anyways, it's as simple as changing like one line of you know text at the top saying, okay, change it from this document type to a different type, it makes it very easy to resubmit to a different journal. So I don't think I would personally use the manuscript preparation stuff here, but I am already using this part. I upload papers in here, and just the ease to be able to go through this and you know, with, with the click of a button just like that, to have it explain something that maybe you didn't know ahead of time, is remarkable, is very, very, very cool stuff. And I think it's gonna absolutely change the way that we interact with information. So my review on this, my, my, my takeaway is that I would use this. If I was a new graduate student, this is what I would be storing my documents in. Either I'd be doing it in Zotero and then bringing them in, importing, um, it's probably what I'd be doing. And when it came time to read things, if I was uncertain about it, I'd read it here first, try and explain it. And if I was still uncertain, I'd ask some follow-up questions. And then I'd go to my PhD advisor or friends or emailing the authors to try and explain things because chances are you're going to get your answers right here. And that's amazing, right? How exciting that our next generation of scientists have access to a tool like this because it's going to be great. That said, I want to caution one more time that these predictions, these answers do come from a large language model that does get some things wrong. And it doesn't tell you when it thinks it's wrong, right? It just says here's the answer. So you do need to use these and take the answers with a tiny bit of a grain of salt and realize that maybe it's wrong. But that said, reading this, you always have the option to Google things, right? You could always come over here and say cation distribution in spinels, if you spelled it right. And you could dig through here and try and figure out the answers. Um, but I think more often than not, this is going to get right. I think it's going to be something that is a very useful part of your workflow. I would plug it in right there, right next to Zotero, because this changes the way that I interact with literature. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, 
kudos to SciSpace for making this product and for reaching out to us. I hope that people in this community and our listeners and you know followers on our social media pages can find this useful as I have. Okay, till next time.